I think a lot of people that are unhappy as an entrepreneur are unhappy because there's three elements to happiness. Okay. There's discipline. Am I practicing discipline? Am I living a a lifestyle that allows me to control the things that I'm in control of? Two, am I full of gratitude? Do I have gratitude for where I'm at? And it sounds like this guy might be missing a little bit of that because you're bored. It's natural. That doesn't mean you're a bad dude. Sometimes we're very thankful. Sometimes we're not. Sometimes we are again. Sometimes we aren't. We feel better when we are. And the last thing is, and this is the big one, is what is my purpose and what is my mission? Is it very clear to find? Do I go after it every single day? And if you have those three elements, it never really gets boring. Uh, it gets boring when you're missing one of those elements. And that's where you start to feel unfulfilled and unhappy in what it is that you're working on. What is up, guys? It's Andy Frisella, and this is the show for the realists. Say goodbye to the lies, the fakeness, and delusions of modern society, and welcome to modern reality. Guys, today we have Q&AF. If you want to get your questions answered on the Q&AF episodes, you can do so a couple different ways. The first way is... Guys, you can email these questions into askandy at andyfrisella.com. All right. We're going to get right into it today, man. All right. Yeah. We've got a fee. It means share the show. Mm-hmm. You know... Buy some of my stuff. Yep. Support the show. We don't run ads on the show. I don't want to. I don't want to be told what I can and can't say in exchange for doll hairs. But uh, I might start doing it. Or yin. I might start doing it. I might start doing it. All right. Because there's a lot of motherfuckers that don't share the show, and I'm passing up on a lot of money. A lot of hoes out there, man. A lot of money. But anyway, I don't take ads. Just gonna make a little deal with you. It's called the fee. It means. If the show makes you think, if it makes you laugh, it gives you new perspective, if it helps you, if it gives you something important to think about in society, please share the show. We're always dealing with censorship, traffic throttling, uh, deplatforming issues. Those are the things that we get for talking about what's going on in the world. So uh, we need you to help us get the show out. So don't be a hoe. Share the show. All right. What's up, dude? What's going on, dog? Not much. Yeah? Yeah. Got a special guest in here today. A special guest. Vaughn. Special. The pastor of disaster. And my co-co-host. That's you. Please tell me I look less white today. I, I, I wish I would. I, I wish, wish I, I could. could. Dude, <laughs> yeah. I just spent like a whole week in the sun at the beach at Hilton Head Island yeah? with my cousin. How much were you actually in the sun? I was in the sun a lot. I'm really? not gonna, I mean, I was, I I was on the beach. We had a private uh, pool. I mean, it was awesome. Yeah, a great cousin. He's very probably he's my most successful cousin. Yeah, yeah. He's like a wealth manager and yeah, family of five. Do you guys have fun? He's a stud. Yeah, yeah. Eric is a great guy, yeah, and and I sp- I spent so much time outside. You know, I mean, maybe, you look maybe, a, you maybe look like you got, got like a little tan. dusting of color or something. I don't know. Yeah, I can see it. I can see it. I'm more interested in this wealth manager. I mean, you know, motherfucker got money when they that's their job is managing other niggas both. Like that's not always. Like I mean, no? is that the right way to say it? I know he I like know, he's got a like portfolio money, of <laughs> seventy people and. I don't know. They give him money and wealth he manager. makes him richer. Isn't that right. a wealth manager? Isn't that what that's called? Financial advisor. Yeah, financial advisor. Depends advisor. on where you're at. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 But uh, good what was cool is on July 4th, we were there and uh, they did this like flyby um, with a bunch of jets and stuff. Well, actually, they, the jets never showed up. They were supposed to be like <laughs> F- <laughs> F-16s. But the World War II stuff, those planes showed up. And that, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Those were awesome. Oh, like cool. P-51, F-4. Yeah. Yeah. Corsair. No, re- really? In yeah, F4? yeah, for sure. That's yeah. pretty cool. I mean, it was rare. really quick, but yeah. it was cool. Yeah. So it was, it was fun. I was hoping I would get a little We bit had an awesome pigment. flyby. There was no planes. There was no planes, though. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I was, hoping I, I was hoping I'd get a little bit more pigment, but I, I don't know how oh, much I get. I think you're all right. A little bit yeah. adjusting. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, uh, Vaughn is the my original co-host from the MFCEO project. And uh, since we're getting ready to launch that again, I figured we've had Vaughn in a couple times, get you guys uh, re-familiarized with him and his his jokes. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll make you guys better. It was like a joke, but it wasn't really a joke. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. If you appreciate dad humor, you will love me. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. All right. Well, what we got today, dude? Sweet, man, well, listen, I got some good one, uh, good ones for you guys. Yeah, man. I got three good ones here. Um, let's knock these out. Let's get into these guys. Andy Vaughn. Question number one. Hi, Andy. Uh, Andy, I've been an entrepreneur since nineteen. 
I've started multiple businesses, some failed, some worked. I've got myself to a stage now where I have stuck to one industry for over five years. Financially, I'm in a good place compared to most people. I make some really good money and the future looks bright in this industry. I see many ways I can scale up. The issue is around how passionate I feel about what I'm doing. I remember you saying in a recent episode that passion is super important to get you past the early stages. I'm already past the early stages now, but far too often I feel myself getting burnt out and dreaming of doing something else, feeling like my full potential will not be found in this industry I'm currently in. I'm scared to chuck away everything I have built to chase an idea, but equally, I don't know how valid these feelings are or if I should stick to what I'm doing. Have you ever felt like this? Is this normal to feel like jumping into a different industry in order to meet my full potential? Or do you think I'm simply in the wrong industry if I'm always feeling like this? My main concern is the amount of time I've spent building the initial compounding up for this current industry. I know how vital that is. However, I cannot keep doing something forever that I don't feel fulfilled in. Can I? I did think about getting this uh, to a stage where it's made me a large amount of money and at that point finding what I'm truly passionate about, but I just feel lost. Thanks, Andy. Is this normal? Is this a normal thing that, that I guess business owners go through, this this idea of passion a few years in? I think that it's very easy for people once they have their basic needs taken care of, once they have a good income stream coming in, to look around and lose the gratitude for what they have. What you have is what you desired more than anything five, six years ago, and now you have it, all right? And you're looking at it and you're saying, well, it would be nice if I could go do this or it would be nice if I could go do that. I think it's important that when you do spend time compounding the effort and the skill set and learning the process and going through this journey, It's very important to remember that you're not always going to feel like doing it. In fact, you're probably not going to feel like doing it once you've done it so many times, but that's what gives you the expertise that you need to be successful. It's about mastering the monotonous actions, all right? And in the beginning, these actions are not monotonous. They're exciting, they're new, they're fresh, and we wanna go do them because we don't have any money coming in and we wanna build this and we're gonna conquer this and we're gonna create that. And it's exciting. And then after we do it a thousand, ten thousand, thirty thousand times, imagine how many times I've done the things that I've become great at over the last 25 years. Probably literally hundreds of thousands of times. And anytime that you do anything at that level of frequency and repetitiveness, it's going to become monotonous. So you have to be okay with a monotonous existence to provide the lifestyle that you're looking to create because you can't become a master of a skill set without that many reps. So we have to be very careful about it. Is this valid or is this not valid? Is this a, how I'm really feeling or is this how I'm really feeling today? And when it comes to passion, passion is an overhyped, over talked about abstract feeling that you do feel in the beginning. And the reason I say it's important in the beginning is because in the beginning, for the first two, three, four years, it's gonna be really hard. And so you have to really care about what you do and the mission that you're on in order to become great at it when you're not getting any money coming back. So what's gonna carry you through that time where things are really hard and you're not making any money? Well, the only thing that's really gonna carry you through is your excitement for what you do and also how much you desire the end result. And so it's very, very important to stop yourself right now at this point in time and ask yourself a real question. Do I feel this way because I'm losing sight of how grateful I am to be in the position that I'm in? Or do I feel this way because this is truly something that I hate doing and I can't do it? 
But the truth of the matter is, is that once we start making some money, once we start becoming successful, and once we get a little bit comfortable, it's very easy to look at other things and say, oh, I'd rather have that, or I'd rather have this. But you have to understand, to have that or to have this is probably going to require the same amount of time investment that you put in to be good at what you're at. So we have to really break down all these pros and cons and you know, the question was, have I ever dealt with this? Well, yeah, dude. You don't think that I look online and dream about completely different lives sometimes? You don't think sometimes I'm like, fuck, dude, I'd really love to live in Tuscany and like just grow fucking tomatoes. You know what I'm saying? Or whatever, right? Like we all have these little dreams that are like, you know, I guess fantasies about what we would do outside of what we currently do. But we have to remember there's a reality and the reality is, is it's very hard to make a decent living for anyone. And if you're in a position where you've put in time and effort and skill to get yourself in a place where you are making a good living, you should really think hard and try to remember what it was like before that, before you just throw it all away. And I see people do this with their business. I see people do this with their relationships. I see people do this with uh, as an entrepreneur in their jobs. They get comfortable, things get a little bit boring, and they want that excitement back. But what they don't realize is that excitement is always temporary. So if you're always chasing that new feeling, just like in a relationship, yeah. if you're always chasing that new feeling, you're going to always be dissatisfied because that new feeling is always fading out. So you have to get comfortable understanding that to be successful is not always exciting. Right. And if I were you, if you want to make it exciting again, I would start thinking about what it is that you do and how you could scale that into a legendary uh, vision that is maybe something that no one's ever done with what it is that you do. OK, so you can make these monotonous things exciting by expanding your vision and expanding your your goal uh, for what it is that you do. And then it plays into your core competencies that you already have a natural skill set for. So. That's my take on it. I think that far too many people value buzz terms and things that are popular on the internet. And they think because they consume these data points all the time from every single person that they must be doing it wrong. And I think we should all consider that maybe the reason that these people talk so much and the reason these people throw out all these buzz terms is because they need to evaluate what they're doing, not you need to evaluate what you're doing. And so a lot of this information that's out on the internet that we read, you know, that's like all this touchy feely, feel good, buzzword shit. You have to realize that as an entrepreneur, that's not for you. That's that that information is not for you. We have to learn how to look at the information that we receive in the proper context that applies to us as opposed to just consuming all of the shit that's on the internet and thinking it's for us because someone with a couple letters behind their name wrote it. All right? The reality is most people will never even get to where you're at and you're going to throw that away because you're comfortable with it now? That doesn't make sense, dude. Mm -hmm. Let me let me ask you this, Andy, because you've also said before, too, it's like, you know, you had a couple of very big, I guess, shifts in perspective in your entrepreneur, uh, you know, timeline, right, where, you know, it was money focused, it was about you, then it switched to the customer focus and delivering that. But then there was a switch also where you had to realize, man, like, I got this far and it wasn't just because of me. It was the people that I had around me, my employees. Yeah. And so then that became a big focus for you, too. Yeah. Is that something that maybe could ignite some new you know, passion, right? Like taking care of the people that helped you get five years in, right? Like, well, well yeah, bro. I mean, look, dude, I think a, a re I think a big reason why a lot of people get bored with what they do is because they, they make it all about themselves. Mm -hmm. And once them once they are taken care of, they don't really have something to work for anymore. And it never crosses their mind ever that they should work to create the dreams that the people that work with them have for them, just like they helped you create the ones for you. And it never, it goes right over people's head. And it's really weird to me because I believe that that's a responsibility if you're on a team to really do your best to present people with a big enough vision and a big enough plan to where they can build their dreams and their lives within it. And then when you really dedicate yourself to that, it becomes a bigger, more motivating purpose than what you even had for yourself. I mean, I could tell you this, and this is true for me. Uh, I don't have to work ever again. Like, 
I don't know that people understand that. Like, I do not have to work. I do not have to be here. I do not have to do this. And that is without me selling any of my companies. Okay. So why do I do it then? Well, I do it because I have people in this building that have been here seven, eight, nine, 10, 17, 18 years. You see what I'm saying? And my goal is to make sure that they and their families are taken care of. And that is a huge motivating factor to me. And so I come in here like, dude, I don't even take a paycheck from this company. Like, that's what people don't know. I come in here every day and work for fucking no paycheck so that I can help these motherfuckers build their shit. And that is more fulfilling and exciting to me than it ever was when it was just about me. And so, yeah, dude, we can expand the vision to, to be about other people. And then if you want to take that a step further, you should take what it is that you do, whatever service or product or whatever business offering you have and figure out how to make that benefit people at the, at the highest possible level. And now you have this exciting business again where you're solving people's problems, you're building people's careers and it, you know, and all the while you're getting some benefit from it because your business is growing and you're building an equitable asset and you're being rewarded with these amazing feelings of like watching people buy houses and build their families. And yeah, it's never easy, you know, and you always wish like, Hey, I wish I could like, you know, do more for these people. But at the end of the day, they have to build their own shit. And the best thing that you can do as an entrepreneur is to give them the opportunity to take the initiative to create their own lane. And uh, some people will take it and some people won't, but it's very fulfilling to make it about other people as well. And I think that's a really, really, really important point. I think a lot of people that are unhappy as an entrepreneur are unhappy because of one main reason, uh, which is they don't have a mission. They don't have a purpose that's outside themselves, right? There's three elements to happiness. Okay. There's discipline. Am I practicing discipline? Am I living a, a lifestyle that allows me to control the things that I'm in control of Two, Am I full of gratitude? Do I have gratitude for where I'm at? And it sounds like this guy might be missing a little bit of that because you're bored. It's natural. That doesn't mean you're a bad dude. Sometimes we're very thankful. Sometimes we're not. Sometimes we are again. Sometimes we aren't. We feel better when we are. And the last thing is, and this is the big one, is what is my purpose and what is my mission? Is it very clear to find? Do I go after it every single day? And if you have those three elements, it never really gets boring. Uh, it gets boring when you're missing one of those elements. And that's where you start to feel unfulfilled and unhappy in what it is that you're working on. Just to circle back and reemphasize some of the things that you said, I think expectations are huge. I mean, I have a great wife. I have five great kids. I get to work with you in my business. I can coach and consult great entrepreneurs. And yet on almost every other day, I feel like shooting myself in the head. Yeah. That's just life. Yeah. You know? And well, don't do so that. I, and so, you know, I'm not yeah. going to, but, and so... I think people's expectations of happiness and just emotional fulfillment on a day-to-day -day basis are very, very unrealistic. And we just need to realize that. And I think if I'm not going to be too hard on this guy, I'm going to say that when you're down and when you're bored, it's usually because you have high standards. And people who have high standards are always going to deal with some sense of dissatisfaction, some sense of wanting to do more, some sense of being bored and getting getting kind of itchy to do something you know better and greater and more life-impacting. And it's like what you said, you really have to go back to that issue of gratitude, cultivate gratitude. Obviously, being content is not the same as being complacent, but reminding you of your blessings, reminding yourself of the things you've accomplished so far, and just keeping your, your head in the right place in that regard. But I would also say this, I love what DJ said about like redirecting your attitude toward um, the people that, you know, are helping you mm -hmm. and reconnecting with your team. I think the other thing that is really important is to, as he's built this company, I think he probably, I'm guessing, has gotten further and further away from the front line. Mm -hmm. So maybe he's not experiencing how his company is really changing lives. And I know with you and me, um, something that completely fueled our fire when we were doing the MFCO is to hear these actual stories mm -hmm. of how people's lives were being changed. I got a, I got a text from a mutual friend of ours um, who, now, who went over a hundred million dollars. Right, isn't that amazing? I and got he, that same one text. of the things he said was, he's like, I learned all of this on the MFC pro CEO project. And Alex, you know, has literally he's 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 literally the case study of taking everything that he learned in that podcast and executing it to the letter. Yeah, and so that that I think 
is so important is don't I've got about a do- your- I've got about half a dozen people who have messaged me from Arte since the day we started that are doing now over a hundred million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. It is amazing. And it makes you feel good. A lot of them started less than eight figures. They were in the, they were barely into seven figures, like a million bucks. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so in five years. Well, and some of them started ground zero. I can promise you this. There's not another motherfucker out there that has testimonials like that. No, no, but it's, it's reconnecting with your team. It's reconnecting with your customers. And maybe, maybe he just needs to do that. Maybe he needs to get on the front lines again and really see how he's impacting. It's a huge deal, dude. I'm happiest when I'm in here working with the team. I think that's a massive fucking point that, that you're making, uh, you know, you're making. Yeah. Like when, when, when we start out and we're excited about something and then we start to, instead of work in the business, we start to work on the business and we back up, we back up, we back up. Now we're detached from this thing that we actually were excited about in the beginning. I totally relate to that. You know, there's nothing better for me than like legitimately still yeah. when I visit the retail stores and I get to talk to people like on the floor, like that's the coolest thing. I get to hear their story. Mm-hmm. I get to hear their struggle. I get to hear where they need help and I get to assist in that. And that's very rewarding. And now I find that with my employees, right? Mm-hmm. But uh, I think that's a great point, dude. Yeah. For sure. Last but, thing I was going to say is just on the issue of uh, passion and motivation. I mean, we obviously understand that that stuff needs to be created. And that's why visualization is so important. That's why connecting every day with your vision you know, what, what you want for your personal happiness, what you want for your relationships, what you want for your professional success, doing that on a regular basis. Because if you don't regularly cultivate it, it's going to die. It's not like you just create this vision for yourself and it's just- One time. Right. Yeah. It's, it's just, you know, static. No, it's dynamic. You have to c- continually revisit it and re-strengthen it so that you create that passion, right? It doesn't just come and go. Yeah. yeah. I love it, man. I love it. Guys, uh, Andy, question number two. Uh, Andy, first, I want to thank you guys. I've been a listener since 2017. I don't think there's an episode I haven't heard. I went back and listened to all the MF CEO episodes. Um, You've had a profound impact on my life uh, for the positive. I've completed 75 hard multiple times and had big leaps forward every single time. My question is, how do you intercept negative thoughts and actions when they come up? I do my best to exercise discipline in the ways you often talk about, but I catch myself taking shortcuts on occasion. Sometimes I don't even realize it till it's too late. Then I'll mentally beat my own ass for it. Uh, It's probably not productive. So how do you catch yourself? Or is it just continuous awareness um, and I'll get better and intercept my mind before I go there? How How does that work? How do you stop those bad thoughts the moment that they come in, if at all? Well, first of all, I think it's important to remember that you're always going to have bad thoughts, no matter how strong, no matter how conditioned your mind is, no matter how mentally tough you become, those negative thoughts are just a part of the human experience. And so we are going to have negative thoughts no matter what. Uh, You take the toughest person in the world that you look up to and you think nothing rattles them, I promise you there's a lot of shit that bothers them. And in fact, I would bet that there's probably a lot more stuff that bothers them than the average person, which is why they're so successful because successful people are usually experts at taking anxious, frustrating, negative thoughts and turning them into productive action. That is one of the biggest separators between people who do and people who don't. It's that people who do have the ability to take those negative thoughts and give them a, sl- a sliver of legitimacy and let that prote- propel them into action. What what people who don't win do is they hear the negative thought and they do one of two things. They either brush it off completely and act like it didn't happen, okay, which then ignores all the signals that are trying to be sent to that person about what they're not doing and what they're supposed to do, or they dwell on it and they paralyze themselves because they let themselves get so negative. And what we have to realize is that there's value in negative thoughts. Usually those negative thoughts are exaggerations of very valid points. These are, these are valid points that you need to address that have been exaggerated in your mind to be, become this mountain of a, a problem when in reality all it requires is a little bit of action. So we have to learn to discern between what is an overly negative thought, what is true and what should be dismissed. And I think that a healthy place to be is to be the person who can 
look at the negative thought, can deduce the truth from it and say, okay, well, this is exaggerated, but I do need to really work on this one thing. And then take that negative thought and then propel it into immediate action. That is what champions do. I've never met someone who is what I would consider successful who doesn't operate that way with negativity. And I think a lot of people, especially earlier in the journey, they believe that having negativity is something that the high achievers do not have. And it's not that they don't have it or they found some trick to get away from it. It's that they've learned how to use it productively without letting it paralyze them. So that's my little take. I mean, what do you think, dude? I think you're right when you say that you're always going to have negative thoughts. Um, and I don't think you can necessarily get rid of them. You just have to replace them. You have to replace them with positive thoughts because it's not, it's not enough just to run away from something bad. You have to run towards something good. And, you know, for me, I, I, you know, working with you, reading different books, there's a, there's a question that I ask myself that, that I got from a book uh, called Relentless Solution Focus that is a very simple question is when I'm, when I'm attacked by a negative thought, it's one, what's one thing I can do right now to make this better? Yeah. What's one thing I can do right now to make this better? That's right. And you don't, you don't focus on perfection. You don't focus on perfectly solving the problem. You, you focus on progress because that's what obviously that's what elite achievers do they focus on getting better they know that you can chase perfection but you're never going to get it right so you just focus on moving along point by point day by day um getting better and and that's i mean that's what works for me and i think that's what works for pretty much everybody i knew who's success successful well dude i also think that it's important to realize that if you could just break this down in a very logical Think about this logically, okay? And let's, I know everybody likes to say, we're not in a competition. This is just about me versus me, blah, 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 bullshit, okay? There's another, there's a whole bunch of people out here trying to do the same shit that you're doing, and there's limited spots for that position, whatever it is, whether it be a place in the market of business, whether it be a place inside of a company, whether it be on a sports team, whether it be auditioning for a play, there are limited spots at the top of the fucking mountain, regardless of what anybody else has told you. And so what you have to think about this is break down what this means to you. If you have a negative thought and most people get the negative thoughts and they shut down, they start saying, poor me, I need therapy, I'm broken, I can't get ahead, my parents screwed me over, I was born in the wrong place. And you start telling yourself all this stuff all right. That's what most people do when the negative thoughts come in. They beat themselves down into paralyzation. Now, if that person then works themselves out, and let's say that takes them two days to get over their negative thoughts. So for like two days, they're quote unquote resting and recovering and processing their feelings. All right. And then you have you. All right. And you get the same negative thoughts this person gets, except when you get the negative thoughts that this person gets, you take those negative thoughts and you act in a way that moves you further from the place that you're afraid of immediately. Meaning, you take that, you pivot your actions into production. Now, compare those two people like they're in a race, all right? They get the same amount of negative thoughts. The first guy gets the negative thoughts, it costs him two, three days every time. The second guy, you, gets the negative thoughts and it supercharges you the right direction every single time. What is the difference in how far you are going to go over the course of 10 years operating like that? It is years of progress we're talking about, either gaining or losing, depending on how you handle negativity and depending on how you process it. And do you process it quickly? Do you let it paralyze you or do you let it propel you forward? And if you can be the person that lets it propel you forward, you're going to have a massive advantage over almost everybody else. And, and if I had to put a percentage on it, I'd say like 99% of people, 99% of people let the negativity stop them in their tracks, stop their action, makes them reevaluate. Instead of pushing through, they start saying, well, maybe I should move to Alaska and become a fisherman. You know, they started looking at all these other things when in reality, dude, you're just getting a signal. It, you should be looking at it like, damn, I'm blessed to have these signals. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of blessed to, to get this little burst of intuition 
that tells me I need to move, right? These are things that matter a lot to the progress of an individual. And when you scale them out over time, dude, it's it's lifetimes of difference. Yeah. And so you just have to think about it practically. You're, you're racing a person who gets paralyzed every time they have negative thoughts. So what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's almost like the negative energy. It's it, it, it's a renewable energy. Bro, the source. dark side energy is fucking a thousand times more potent than positivity. The mental health days. That's that solar energy bullshit. It's Bro, like, listen. <laughs> it's like the EV shit. Listen, dude. It's a big prop. The victim yeah. culture that's perpetuated in society is a huge problem for high achievers because high achievers, that information is not for them. That information is for everybody else. It's for all the people who aren't going to ever really do anything, who are going to wallow in their own lives, in their own situations, and they're going to create an identity around why they can't and why they're broken and why they're upset. And that information isn't for you to consume as a driven, ambitious person. That's for other people who are never going to do anything. The information that you need to consume is, all oh, the information is going to make you not like them. All right? So... I don't know any high achievers that honestly like spend a lot of time in that in that you know touchy feely in touch with their emotions type shit. It's, mm-hmm. I, I, dude, even me like I was around it for 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 four or five years with a lot of people who were very much into that, and bro, it infected me. It infected my mentality. It infected my personality in a negative way. Where I was like always processing like how I felt and like I always felt like shit. You know why? Because like I was all I ever thought about. Why do I fucking feel weird? Why do I feel weird? What you know what you know what cured it? Getting in the fight, bro. Warriors need a fucking war. They need a project to build. They need an enemy to conquer. They need a mission. They need a purpose. Ambitious people need that. If you you know you don't need rest, bro. You need you need something to do. You know, and and so when we think about like how high achievers are wired versus everybody else, we have to like really realize that a lot of this information that's on the internet is poisonous to what we're trying to accomplish. Now, I'm not saying that it doesn't help some people; it probably does. But I can tell you this: sitting around focusing on your problems all day long is never going to help anybody mm-hmm. ever. It's going to make it worse. It, it, very unpopular opinion, but I think when people are down on themselves, or when we're down on ourselves, our our natural human response is to want to show compassion and want to be empathetic and that sort of thing. But the reality is, is that when I'm down on myself, it's usually for two reasons. Number one, I'm being selfish. I'm just being prideful and focused on myself. And I've lost the reality that really it's not about me, that my motivation should be to provide value to other people. It should be to help other people. So get the focus off myself, get it onto other people and get to work. And that's the second point is that it's often because I'm lazy. I'm making excuses. I want to I want to look at myself and I want to say, "Oh, I'm so deficient in XYZ. I'm just never going to do anything special in life." Well, no. Stop getting your focus off yourself. And as you put it many times in the MFCO project, put your faith in the work. Yeah. Get your focus off yourself. Stop wallowing in self-pity and just get to work. And when you when you make it your point to help people, when you get the focus off them and on uh, excuse me, off yourself and onto them, and when you put your faith in the work and take action, the negativity dissipates. Well, dude, and also, you know, if you've never done anything before, how how do you know that the work is going to work? You don't. Right. Okay? And that paralyzes a lot of people. A lot of people say Man, I'd really like to climb Mount Everest, but how how do you climb it? Well, bro, you climb it just like everybody else climbed it. It's one fucking step at a time. And it's going to be hard and you're not going to be able to breathe and it's going to it's going to be one of the hardest things you've ever done in your life. But other people have done it, so you could do it too. And so we have to realize that you know, we we can't live in this place of idealistic thought we have to live in reality and in reality if you do the work eventually some good things are going to happen okay and when when the good things happen you get a burst of confidence you say look i'm i did this work and it's working and at the first time that ever happens you're so excited you can't even believe it and then what happens you keep doing the work because you got a little taste of something and then and then another win happens Mm -hmm. and all of a sudden now you have a little bit more confidence and then you keep working and another win happens and it's bigger than the first two and then you keep working a little bit more 
So what ends up happening is you start to realize that you're just like everybody else. If you do the work, the result will be there. And this idea that, oh, I'm going to do all this work and it's not going to work for me, that's total bullshit, okay? What one man can do, another can do. And if one person goes through the maze, you can go through the maze. Mm -hmm. But you have to realize that you're going to have to start walking before you figure out that you can get to the other side. And that's the big discovery, of, I guess, of entrepreneurship is that we have to do the work to get the belief. We don't have the belief and then do the work. You might have a little belief. You might say, well, I think I can do this, but that's not really belief. That's sort of like, this might be a good idea, right? To <laughs> actually here. have this unshakable, unrelenting belief in what you are doing and who you are and what you are capable of, you have to go down the path with the work. So you have to put the faith in the work first, get a little bit of reward, you believe a little bit. Go a little bit further down the path. Get a little bit more reward. Your belief goes up. You do that for five or six years, bro, you're going to realize that you're capable of anything as long as you go down the path. And most people won't go down the path because they always ask themselves this, what if I do all this work and it doesn't work? And that's just not a reality. I've never seen, I've never, ever, ever seen someone who does the work the proper way and fucking fails. It does not actually happen. It's a myth. If you look at the failed businesses, if you look at the failed relationships, if you look at the failed fitness journeys, it's one of two things. Either one, they didn't do the work long enough to get the result, or two, they were doing the wrong work, okay? So you, were, you thought you were doing it, but you were doing the wrong thing. Th that's just as important. You have to know that you're on the right path. So how do we know we're on the right path? We follow people who have been on the fucking path. And this is why I talk to you guys about not buying these cornballs, entrepreneurs, courses who haven't built anything. Because how the fuck do you know how to get to China if you've never fucking been to China? Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. So that's how you know. You follow someone's path. You role model them. You learn by watching them. And uh, yeah, Vaughn, the fucking work is going to come before the belief. And if you want strong belief in yourself, you're going to have to do things to earn it. That's why 75 Hard is such a valuable program because you lack belief, you lack confidence, you lack grit, you lack perseverance, you lack all of the things that you actually need to, that encompass what's called mental toughness to achieve. Once you develop these things, you have high confidence and you know that you can achieve. And that's the most powerful thing of the program. It's not that people don't know what to do. It's that they don't have enough discipline to fucking actually do it which is what costs you everything in your life yeah i love it man andy i want to ask you this because i don't, I don't want to lose this and, and and this is listen this is a real ass question all right and and this might go over some people's head all right but i, I want you to give me a real answer here okay because we, we, we're talking about using this negative energy negative energy is powerful either way it could be it could help really help you or it could really fuck you up right depending on how you use it are there times that you or maybe somebody else that you know, high achievers, right, where they will literally create this negative energy out of fucking nowhere? Yeah, I do it every day. With zero substance. I do it every day. Can we talk about that? Yeah. I wake up in the morning and I don't want to get out of bed. Yeah. Because I don't sleep very well. So yeah. every morning I wake up, I'm fucking exhausted. I haven't woke up one time in the last 25 years and been like, damn, dude, I slept good. It's just not reality for me. <laughs> Um, and don't fucking send me your fucking <laughs> protocols and all your fucking try this bamboo back, mattress. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> motherfucker, I tried it all. Okay, I've had a ton put, of sleep studies. Put crystals in your butt. You That's right. <laughs> don't don't send me your shit. That's what happens all the time. Yeah, everybody's a backyard expert. Like I just, I've struggled with it for forever. I've never tried, explored yeah, the solution. Yeah, tried to fix it. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so when I wake up, I'm tired. So I have people I hate on the internet, mm -hmm. right? And so what I do is I go right to their pages quietly. I see what the fuck they're doing. I get really pissed off. I get the fuck out of bed. Mm -hmm. And I say, I'm going to beat the shit out of these people today. I, and dude, I use it every single day to get going. Every single day. Because it gives me anxiety a little bit in the morning. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I better get up. Because these, th these motherfuckers are at it already. Yeah. Okay? And, and like... You know, I might not well, actually some deep shit right here, man. I might not actually hate them, <laughs> right. but I I do because I want to beat them. Mm. You know what I'm saying? So I convince myself 
that they're the enemy when in reality they're probably just doing their own cool, thing. Cool, man. Yeah, <laughs> it reminds me of like the you know the movie The Water Boy when uh, when when Bobby Boucher is on the field and like he puts his uh, that dude's face on the other player. He's like, what'd you say about my yeah. mama? You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like he's creating that. But well, like, that's that's powerful, that ori- that's a play on a scene from the program. So if you've ever seen the program, which is a famous football movie, mm-hmm. it's the best football movie ever fucking made. Really? Yeah. Even better than Remember the Titans. Yes. The pro anybody that actually played football knows the program. Okay. Place it at the table. Yes, right. Starting defense, place at the table. Mm. There's this scene where Alvin Mack, who is the star middle linebacker, starts looking at this dude on the field and starts being like, I saw you come out of my mama's house. Blah blah like it starts <laughs> like making this shit up. And the guy's like, What are you talking about? I don't know your mom. And he right. fucking kills the guy. Right. So like Michael Jordan's famous for I, that, too. I was too. just going to say, yeah. there are rookies that will say, yeah. like, during games, he'll look at him and go, what'd you say to me? I didn't say anything to you, <laughs> Mr. Jordan. No, you're disrespecting me. Yeah. And he would just create it in his head yeah. that these these rookies were disrespecting him, and then yeah. the rest mm. is history. It's a big deal, dude. Yeah. A lot, lot, very, all, you know how Tim Grover talks about cleaners? Mm-hmm. Everybody out there, you think you're a fucking cleaner? You don't know shit about cleaning, okay? Fucking... Tim Grover is the only person in the world that can tell someone if they're a cleaner or not. You're not a fucking cleaner. Otherwise, you, would, you wouldn't even think you were because that's how much of a cleaner you would be. He talks about this all the time. He's like the greatest people fucking invent problems to solve. They invent enemies. And three things that I have to have for me to feel motivated out of the three things is I ha- one of them is I have to have an enemy. I have to have someone to defeat. And, um, so, you know, when you're beating everybody's ass, sometimes you got to make that, uh, make that up. Oh. You know what I mean? Or you've got to expand who your enemy is. Maybe, you, maybe it's not this guy that's behind you that you've been stomping on for a while. Maybe it's this dude that's 10 miles ahead of you. And that, you, just, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's some deep shit, man. Yeah. Well, Rush it. Limbaugh was pretty popular up until 91, but he took off in 92 because Bill Clinton became the president. And then suddenly, Rush Limbaugh had this like ultimate enemy that he could leverage and go after, and it brought out the best of him, and he obviously ended up becoming a legend in broadcasting. Mm. I love it, man. I love it. Well, guys, Andy, question number three, uh, third and final question. Uh, hey, Andy, I'm 18 years old, and I just finished high school. My school went virtual three years ago, and then we went back in person my senior year But it just felt weird and wrong. I and many of my peers had a really hard time adjusting back to in person. I feel like I'm just completely socially awkward. I have a hard time speaking to people, meeting new people, and it honestly gives me a lot of anxiety to even have to think of doing it. I'm not afraid of people. I just feel like I get in those situations and don't really know what to do. I don't really even remember what it was like before this. Can I fix this? Of course. You're, this is a perishable skill. People skills are a perishable skill. If you don't practice them, it becomes uncomfortable. All right? Especially if you're an introverted human. I am an introverted human that has had to learn extroverted skills. And most people, when they meet me, they're like, there's no fucking way this dude's an introvert. No, I am an introvert. An introvert. I had to fucking learn the skills. Most of my time, I spend alone. All right. And I have no problem with it. I'm not trying to like, <laughs> you know, call Vaughn and say, Vaughn, I'm always alone. No, Vaughn calls me. I'm like, what do you want? I'm alone. Leave yeah. Me alone. <laughs> right. <laughs> so like, I'm not having these fucking problems with it. Like, it's what I like. And my skill set has become so strong that it doesn't even show. Right. But when we get ourselves out of that as introverts, like if I'm not around people for a long time or I don't like, you know, because, dude, there's there's months at a time where I'm not around anybody but here, mm-hmm. right? And I know these people. These people are family to me. But, like, I'm talking about outside. Right. <clears throat> um, my skills diminish. It's just like shooting a pistol or playing a guitar or, uh, you know, being fit. If you don't practice it on a regular basis, your skill set diminishes. And so can you get it back? Yeah, you, you can get it back very easily. Do you know how you brush up on a skill set that, you have diminished, you go practice, all right? So how can you put yourself in a position in today's day and age with the technology that we have to have reps in terms of people skills? Well, there's a number of things you can do. 
You can get a job where you have to talk to people every day. Retail jobs are great for this, okay? But one thing that you could do without changing your job is something that I used to do all the time. I made a little exercise for myself, uh, which is actually part of Live Hard in Phase 3, where I made myself go into a grocery store and actually have conversations with people. And so when I was bad with people and I realized that I needed to improve, what I would do is I would go to the grocery store and I would force myself to have three conversations with total strangers. These are not conversations like, hey, nice shoes. I'm talking about a conversation, okay? And three or four times, you're going to get shut down. People are going to look away. They're, they're going to act weird. And you have to get through that. That's the point, okay? And once you start to get back into the the zone of having these reps where you talk to people, you get used to it again, you get good at it again, and and the problem that you're having dissipates. So yeah, dude, you could definitely get that back, um, but you got to put yourself in a position to take the reps. Mm -hmm. Actually, a lot of studies have been done on this and to encourage people to actually do it. You're right, that you will encounter people who are just don't know how to handle you right. and and don't know what it's your, rarely personal your motive though is. Right. it's just they're 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 in the same boat that you're in they're 100%. like what are you doing talking to me 100 percent. Like, <laughs> but they've done all sorts of studies on this and the reality is is that most people are anxious about opening up a conversation with a stranger but 90 to 95 percent of people who are surveyed say that they are very open to responding to a stranger they just don't want to initiate it so that's good for news for anybody who wants to practice their skill set is that those people might not, you know, start the conversation, but they will engage in it. But the other thing that I, I find really interesting, and I just read this in a book called Super Communicators uh, by Charles Duhigg, is that most people really don't want to do, you know, shallow um, small talk. They're fine if you launch into a, a serious conversation. They're fine if you launch into a deep topic. And so you have the opportunity to not just strengthen your skill set in terms of your people skills, but you have the opportunity to get reps on how to really build rapport with people, how to go deep with them. And I mean, can you think of a better thing that you need to be able to do to succeed in business and life no. and to be able to connect deeply with another human being? It's absolutely 100% essential. Yeah. I feel like too, you know, even, I mean, especially like this younger generation, man, there's a lot of things that I think have kind of just been left out. And and we we cover a lot of this stuff on the other episodes, you know, but not going too deep here, but it's like even just simple stuff like a handshake, man. Like how important a handshake is. Dude, I think we're in a situation in culture right now where a lot of people think that they can get by without the people skills. But what they don't realize and what you what you have to understand is that understanding people is essential to sales, even if you're doing it digitally. If you're a digital sales marketer and you don't have people skills, you're going to be shitty at marketing to people. So having people skills is... It's the foundation of all business success because you can create a cash flow machine and you can create a funnel and sell a widget, but how are you going to market if you don't understand people? If you don't understand their wants, their needs, their desires, their problems, the only way you could do that is by talking to people. And the person who has people skills versus the person who doesn't is going to win exponentially bigger. This is a big reason why I'm successful in business and more successful than a lot of other people. A lot of people that I compete with did not have to do business pre-internet, okay? My first 10 years in business was in person before social media and before the internet really became what it is today. So what did I learn during that time? I learned all these skills of how to deal with people, how to talk to people, how to go through a sales process, all of these things. And when that translates into technology, it makes you immensely more powerful than any of your competitors that don't understand that. So if you do have the people skill set, you have to understand most of your young colleagues and most of your young uh, peers are ignoring that skill set, thinking that they can get around it. And if you put the time into getting it and you learn the skill sets that they have, you'll crush them. You'll run them the fuck over. OK, so having great people skills. And by the way, this translates into who you're going to date or who you're going to marry or who your friends are going to be like. Do you really want to create 
this little cash flow funnel and you think that you're going to have all these high quality friends. That's not how it works, bro. I don't sit around with my wealthy friends and talk about bullshit. We talk about real things. We talk about real business. And you know what we talk about the most? How to manage our businesses. And you know what that is? That's people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you don't have people skills or a deep understanding of people, not only will you not be as successful in business, you won't be interesting and you won't have a great friend circle. All right. Because here's the truth of the high level people that you want to be around. They assume you are already making money. That's no one cares. Like no one gives a fuck how much no one in the wealthier circles sits around and talks about how much money they make. They don't because everybody has it. So what do they talk about? They talk about how to scale, how to grow bigger, what new ideas, how do we get people to do this? How do we create that? How do we put this initiative in play? How do we move people this direction? How do we create our organization to be this? Those are the things that are discussed. It's not Taylor Swift's new tour and the widget that you sold through your click funnel. No one fucking cares, man. So realize that even if you're a little bit successful with your digital platform, if you don't have people skills, not only will you not be as good as you could be, you're going to get crushed by people who have it. And by the way, the people who crush you that have it are going to have awesome relationships and awesome connections and a deeper network, which is going to make them even more formidable to compete with. So if you're young and you don't have people skills or you're an introvert and you don't have people skills, I would highly recommend making an intentional investment in developing those any way that you can because it's becoming more and more rare, which means it's more and more powerful. I love it. The young man mentioned that just making that transition back from COVID and virtual to in-person and real, it, it, it you know produces a lot of anxiety, social anxiety. And Andy, you've talked about before that a huge way to overcome that is to do what you call auditing your intent. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. Well, look, dude, if you, if you have the right intent, it's really hard to mess up. Okay. You know, this is the, the power of intent is something that I've learned through the course of learning how to speak. When I first started speaking, you know, I was standing in front of eight people in one of my stores with a piece of paper in my hand, shaking like a leaf, scared to death, right? Now I go on stage in front of fucking, it doesn't matter how many people, right? And I'll go up there and and crush it. And people ask all the time, they're like, well, how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, it's very simple. If you have the proper intent, I am here to serve. I am here to help. I am here to teach. I am here to make sure that these people walk out of this room better than they walked in the room. That intent, they can feel. So what you say and how you behave kind of gets lost and overshadowed by the intent that you have. So it becomes very difficult to fuck up when you have the proper intent about delivering some sort of benefit. And in the sales process or in the people process, it's the same thing. If your intent with a customer is to help them solve the problem the best way that you can in a way that makes them say, damn, dude, I really enjoy doing business with these people. If you have that intent, my intent is not to sell you. My intent is to solve your problem. You are going to make more money than everybody else because everybody else is selling and you're helping. And a lot of people think, well, that's just a creative word switcheroo. No, it's a totally different thing because selling has one intent and helping has another intent. All right. And people know the difference. Everybody knows. Do you know when you're you're being sold? 100%. Do you know when you're being sold? Do you guys listening know when you're being sold? You're all shaking your head yes. Everybody knows. So what's standing out to you when you meet someone who who doesn't sell you? Well, it's their intent. They fucking care. They want to solve my problem. They were very helpful. They didn't push me. They made me feel good about what I'm doing. They were there for me post-sale. Very, very important concepts for your company or your individual position of being an entrepreneur. So go ahead. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to. I, and and uh, on the issue of intent and knowing when you're getting sold, for me, a clear indication that somebody is trying to sell me rather than help me is that they're just talking. Yeah, they just have a monologue. Yeah. they're not. They're not asking questions. They're not listening. They're not. They have a. They the have a rehearsed. Mm-hmm. Yes, they have a rehearsed. Script. <laughs> Script that they have said a million yeah. times. Hey, sir, thank you for coming in. Today. No, no, yeah. no, it's not like that. That's not what it is. It's a, it's, here's what it is. This is what, this is why salespeople get like that. They start like that. Mm. Okay. They start, they don't know shit. 
Then they figure out a little bit of stuff and they start to come up with like a little talk track. Hey, Steve, how you doing? How's the family? How's your kids? Oh, your kids play soccer? My kids play soccer. And they have this like cheese dick presentation that that they think sounds really good, but they don't realize that they're not fooling anyone. And so what it is, is it's someone's, it's a salesperson's own ego thinking that they are smarter than the customer and they've had success with this talk track getting in the way of actually actually listening, actually communicating, actually having a conversation. And dude, anybody who's an experienced salesperson can see this immediately. This happens a lot with young salespeople. Young salespeople, they think that they're so smart. They think that they understand more. This person you're talking to has been on the earth just as long as you, if not longer. Do you think they've never been sold before? Do you think you're the first person to come up with some sort of talk track that's, hey, Steve, how you doing, man? Da, 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 da. Like with this fake enthusiasm that you do, like, dude, it's important to be enthusiastic, but you should be enthusiastic with the right intent. Hey, yeah. Vaughn, dude, listen, man, we're going to get you where you're trying to go. All right. Like this, you have to actually care. It's not this. Mm-hmm. fucking rehearsed talk track that's repeated 70 times a day because you have so many calls to make. And that's the difference between people who make a lot of money and people who don't. People who make a lot of money in sales, in business, they take the person in front of them and they treat them like a human being. They listen, they respond appropriately, they solve the problem, and they do so in a genuinely enthusiastic way because their intent is aligned perfectly with what this person is trying to get. And so when we talk about like Vaughn's mentioned a couple times on this show, helping people, right? Changing people's lives. Like these are things that allow you, if you think about what it is that you do, to have the right intent when you speak to someone. Your job, like for example, my job with employees is to offer so much value that if they leave our company and they go somewhere else, they say, dude, I learned more working there than anywhere else I could have ever worked. That's my intent when I teach our employees. It's not about just here, it's about everywhere they go. So if my intent is that for them, how do you think they feel about me? You see what I'm saying? Now, if I went in there and I said, just do this for this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and I tried to like teach them all the hacks and the tricks and then this, they're gonna walk out of there being like, bro, this is some bullshit, right? I should be selling fucking home warranties or car warranties because it doesn't, this doesn't really mean anything. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we have to fucking find that right balance. Where's your intent? How much do you actually care? Are you trying to solve the problem? And then that, by the way, that doesn't just happen to the customer. That's with your employees too. What is your intent for your employees? Is your intent to milk every ounce of productivity out of this person for the cheapest possible amount of money? Or like most jobs, or is your intent to put them through the process of growth and let them understand that if they do this and learn this and apply these skills and do so over time and they use the you know the the skill skill set effort plus time formula which is what success that's all success is all success is how hard you work what kind of skills you have and what kind of time you put in and if you if you teach people this and you teach them skills they they love you for that because you actually give a fuck about them mm-hmm. this is the same way with friends it's the same way with employees it's the same way with customers it's just a way of life that if you live is not only extremely fulfilling and rewarding but also highly profitable and a lot of people in business they don't understand how much more business there is to get if they would just look at it that way right like they're in business they're saying oh i'm I'm doing well i'm making bro if you're someone right now and you think I'm doing great. This is bullshit. All I got to do is keep doing this. Dude, you would probably make 10 times the amount of money if you could figure out how to implement what it is I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. That's the truth. Because Mm -hmm. now, not only do people just come to you, they're out there telling people to go to you. You see what I'm saying? They become loyal. They're not just satisfied. Totally different thing. Absolutely. I, I, I'll be honest with you. This kind of stuff is what I, I'm super interested in this. I, uh, this is my jam. This is what I, I try to become the best student possible uh, that I can on impacting people, making a connection with people. I love watching you over the years, how you connect with people, knowing you're an introvert and yet being at Summer Smash, seeing how you're got the eye contact going, got the the handshake, got the asking the questions. And for me, as I've observed and read and studied, to me, there's a difference between 
The thing that makes the difference between average people who know how to communicate and connect and the elite level connectors are the average people ask questions about, about facts and elite level people ask questions to build friendship. And I've, I've kind of come up with a little acronym for me to help me remember is L-O-V-E, love. What kind of questions should, should you ask people? Ask them what they like. Ask them their opinion. Ask them what they value. Ask them about their experiences. Don't just ask, oh, what do you do for a living? No, ask, hey, what's, what's the greatest thing about what you do? What do you enjoy the most? Or uh, where are you from? Don't ask where you're from. Say, what's what do you love the most about where you're from? You get people to ask questions, or sorry, you ask people questions that get them to share what's inside of them, what they value, what, they, what, what they've experienced, what they like, all that stuff. And that builds rapport. That creates emotional connection, and, which sounds a little foo-foo. But what I mean by that is it's, it's, it's what... I've got an acronym for that. Yeah. It's G-A-Y. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gauge um, the person where they are. <laughs> I'm just kidding, bro. I love it. No, I love no. it. I just had to I just no, had to, no. I, yeah. I, I couldn't think of a witty comeback for that. I R A No, forget it. Um But you're really good at asking questions. I mean, when we first met, you were asking great questions. And, and I was the one who was interviewing you, right? When we first met it, when I was an um, editor at a, a magazine. But um, I think that's just showing genuine interest in people and not asking these canned questions like you were saying, these cheese dick questions that, that salespeople ask and, uh, and really wanting to get to know people and to value them. And if you do that, people are going to respond really well. Yeah, they just I agree. Are. I'm just teasing. That was really no, good. No, no, no. Yeah. I know. I know yeah. you were. I'm used to it. I'm not really teasing. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, guys, Andy Vaughn. That was three. Yeah, man. Hey, thanks for coming in on the show, dude. I, I think this is really relevant to a lot of the young guys and gals who are listening to this. I think that there's this idea that to be a charismatic, really great people person, um, you have to be this super eloquent speaker. You have to be really polished. It's just not true. You have to be authentic to who you are. And I think that anybody who's ever had an experience like where they went into somewhere and, and maybe there was a, um, a person and they were really nervous and they weren't really, uh, you know, polished, but you could tell that that person really wanted to help you. Like that makes all the difference in the world. So I don't want anybody thinking that to, to be this great people person, you have to be super sophisticated and polished. You in don't. Fact, I, think that's you don't. A, I, think, I think that's such a myth bro that that actually handicaps people a lot because one it makes them not start because they don't think they're polished enough or two they're so polished they don't connect right million dollar smile yeah right right you know right. what i'm saying remember that guy yeah yeah oh yeah but so he's dead oh damn <laughs> <laughs> what he said he's dead oh is he he you die mean, let's get ready to smile rumble. no what it was it i'm fired up that guy that guy passed away yeah he did oh he did he's dead damn all right. well, I guess he's got the zero dollar smile, huh? <laughs> hey, look, if you guys enjoyed today's show, remember, we have the MS CEO project coming back. Now, it's going to be on a private platform. It's not going to be on iTunes. It's not going to be on uh, Spotify. So you're going to have to pay attention for when it comes out. We'll make sure that we hit you on the email blast. If you're not on the email list, go on to andyforsella.com. Get subscribed to the Andygram. I'll send you an email every day. I'm not going to spam you. But I'm going to send you a motivational slash informational slash uh, positive information email that you're going to get every single morning. It serves as my posts, sort of like what I used to do on Instagram, mm -hmm. but it just comes through email. So a lot of you guys are like, why don't you post? Dude, I haven't missed a post in four or five years. Every single morning you get one if you're on the email list. And if you're on the email list, um, you know, you'll know when the MS CEO project gets going too. So I'm really looking forward to that. These are some of my favorite types of conversations uh, you know, I love talking about what's going on in the world and I love joking around with you guys, but at the end of the day, the, the solution to what's happening here, um, is not just awareness, it's execution, it's skill set, And that's what we're working to build with you guys, uh, with this new project that we're getting ready to launch. So let me ask you a question. Yeah. Some of your listeners not, might be wondering this. Uh, why bring MFCO back? Why not just have me on Real AF and, and do Q&As like we're doing today? Because, first of all, I think we when we moved from doing MFCO into doing Real AF, I saw a need. 
okay? And the need was there was not enough awareness to what was happening in the world. And because there was not enough awareness to what was happening in the world, the soil that allows us to grow our businesses out of was becoming infertile where we couldn't even have the opportunities that I've been blessed enough to have. And I recognize that I'm usually two or three years ahead of what I see coming down the road. And that comes from being an entrepreneur. That comes from me having to look down the tracks with my business to figure out what's going to happen so I can anticipate that. So I applied that to Real AF for the last four years, four and a half years. And the awareness is there. People have woken up. They they understand their responsibility. They understand they have a responsibility to be great. And I enjoy doing the CTIs with DJ. We have a good time. It's it's more humor. It's as much humor now as it is information. And we have fun doing that. Um, but I've also recognized, and we're not going to stop doing that because it is fun. But I've recognized that there's a very big need for tactical information, again, uh, about teaching, especially young people, how to win. Um, you know, the education system is failing. We have a lot of parents out here that don't know what to do with their kids and don't want to send their kids to a $200,000 university. Um, and I think, you know, I have a duty to share with the, the generation coming behind me, all the things that I've learned along the way. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to create a new version of, you know, personal development, skill set, practical skill set, how to think, how to act, what the skills are, um, that is, you know, in a podcast format. And we're going to bring back, you know, what is the most successful entrepreneur podcast of all time. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. Me too, bro. I enjoy the conversations. Yeah. Like I, genu- sure. I genuinely, I don't always enjoy talking about what's going on in the world because it drains me. But when I have these conversations and I share like, you know, what I've learned and, and, and all these things, I know it truly helps people because I hear from you guys all the time. And that's what we need. I think we have a lot of people now that realize like, oh shit, I can't just coast. If I do just coast, you know, our country's going to, and our culture is going to be bad. And I think we're in a situation where when we started doing the MS CEO, we caught a lot of people that just wanted to make money and be successful. Now with Real AF, we've caught a lot of people that understand they have an obligation to be the best that they can to, to protect the country. So we have two different groups of people. We have a group of people that wanted to be successful because they want to be successful. And then we have a group of people now who have figured out that they have an obligation to be the best that they can possibly be. And so now we're in a situation where we need to start teaching those skill sets. And the, the, the reality is, is I'm a different human and I think differently, even though a lot of the lessons are practically going to be similar. There's a whole lot of new perspective that I've had since we stopped that podcast. I'm a much better operator. I'm way, way more intelligent in business. I'm way more educated in different levels of business because since then our company has grown exponentially. Um, So there's a lot of new information and there's a lot of new things. And I think when we really talk about personal excellence being the ultimate rebellion, we, we, you and me have to put our efforts towards actually cultivating uh, this next generation of leaders and winners. And, and that's, that's, you ask why that's why. Yeah. Well, personal excellence is the ultimate rebellion. And in my opinion, uh, excellence in business and life is the ultimate form of patriotism. Yeah. Yeah. And well, and also, um, I think it honors the creator pretty well. hundred percent. You know, what's your feelings on that? We talk oh, yeah. about that a lot. Yeah. We talk about that a lot. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, the greatest thing you can do, um, as an act of worship to God is to become who you were meant to be Yeah, and to fulfill your potential and to do everything you can to maximize the time you're on earth, the treasure that you've been given, the talent you've been given, um, and to turn every opportunity into a win. Yeah. Um, I think that's, that's very honoring God. Yeah, I agree. So that's why, and we've been working on it. <laughs> we've been working on this project for almost two years, guys. Mm-hmm. So we're very, very excited to get it launched for you guys uh, very, very soon. So keep an eye out for that email. We'll also talk about it here on Real AF, and we'll let you guys know. Um, but dude, thanks for coming in and being on the show, bro. Oh, you bet. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, I appreciate you. All appreciate right, guys. You too, DJ. Huh? I appreciate DJ too. I appreciate you, Vaughn. He's yeah. got more melon in my. Let's go to the pool. Skin, but... Let's go to the pool. <laughs> it's raining. We gotta go in the pool and cry. It's raining though. Yeah, what did okay. you used to call that? Rubbing dicks together. Yeah, tummy sticks. T- I, is that a new sword thing? fighting? Sword fighting. Battle dicks. Battle dicks. <laughs> That's for the OGs out there. That's right. 
<laughs> There's lots of names for it. There's a few things out there we could use. I like to play battle dicks. <laughs> That's my favorite one. They're in the drawer. We yeah. Can make it, you know, we can do something. Yeah. <laughs> all right, guys. You got anything else? That's all I got, man. All right. That was three. All right, guys. Uh, go pay the fee. Thank you.